Hey, Golf Country fans! You might have seen my earlier video in which I removed the fuel tank. Well, in this video, I reinstall it. First things first, I siphon most of the fuel out of the tank. Then I blocked off the holes to keep dirt out during cleaning. Using a wire brush, I gently sloughed off the loose dirt. By the way, most of this dirt is from Germany. A previous owner used to drive this car off-road when hunting for wild boar in the forest. I've been finding this same light-colored dirt throughout the car while dismantling the suspension and frame. I switched to a nylon brush that wouldn't mar the plastic surface. Next, I went over the whole tank with a Scotch-Brite pad and compressed air. With most of the Rhinelander dirt removed, I scrubbed the fuel tank with Goo Gone. Some handwritten markings from the factory were still visible. 4950-16A The only parts left to remove were the filler neck grommet and the sending unit. I found that the pre-pump's output hose was disconnected from the gravity valve. That'll need fixing. I used navel jelly to remove some rust scale that the metal straps left on the plastic tank body. A green Scotch-Brite pad worked the best. Finally, I washed the tank with soapy water in order to remove any chemical film left behind by the Goo Gone or the navel jelly. I used my Depstech Wi-Fi endoscope to inspect the interior of the fuel tank. The iPhone app automatically detects the endoscope's Wi-Fi signal, connects to it, and activates the camera. I clicked record so you could see what I saw. Nothing too surprising inside. I could see where the siphon tube scraped off the thin film on the bottom of the tank, but not much else. I'll give the tank a thorough rinsing with fresh gasoline before reinstalling it. My straps were rusty but serviceable. New ones are hard to find and expensive, so I decided to reuse what I had. I first ran the straps over the wire wheel in order to remove as much loose rust as possible. Then I stripped the remaining rust using the blast cabinet. On freshly stripped steel, I like to use a self-etching primer to help prevent future rust. For the top coat, I sprayed the parts with gloss black Rust-Oleum. I bought two new OEM style bolts to replace the rusty original strap mounting bolts. The holes that these bolts screw into haven't been cleaned out yet. 
I like to chase out the old threads using my tap and die set before screwing in new hardware. First step is to verify the thread pitch. In this case, the pitch is 1.25 millimeters. I then select the corresponding tap to fit the matching hole on the car. I use a lightweight cutting oil like Tap Magic or Marble Mystery Oil to lubricate the tap, which I gently twist back and forth until it turns freely. It's a little hard to see, but this is why I chase my threads. It cleans out unwanted rust, dirt, and paint, and provides a better fit. Call me picky, but I prefer not having this gunk in my bolt holes. I like to apply an anti-seize thread compound to the new threads to prevent corrosion and make it easier to remove the bolts later. The biggest problem I encountered with this fuel tank involved the fuel filler neck. Unfortunately, the mounting bracket up inside the rear fender well was rotted away, leaving the filler neck dangling by its hoses. I carefully disconnected the three hoses and removed the filler neck. The ground wire rusted free from the filler neck and its other end rusted free from the body. With the filler neck out of the way, you can see how little of the mounting bracket remains. And after some cleaning, it's obvious that the rust penetrated the inner fender. Here's the same hole viewed from inside the trunk. In bad weather, water can splash up from the tire, through this hole, and into the trunk, so I decided to patch it. Normally I would take the time to fabricate a proper metal patch, but because I'm planning to restore the body in the next couple of years, I opted to temporarily fill the hole with fiberglass. Two ounces of resin was plenty for this small job. I should have put the camera in a better position so you could actually see what I was doing. After the fiberglass hardened, I knocked down the high spots with some 80 grit sandpaper. I found this paint at Menards. It's not a perfect match, but I don't care too much because the patch will be covered by an interior panel. Here's the finished temporary patch. And here's that interior panel I mentioned. Back underneath the car, you can see the fiberglass patch peeking through. As a temporary stopgap, I sprayed this area with rust converting paint. Here you can see the remnants of the filler neck's mounting bracket. The neck mates up against that curved contour. The ground wire's metal tab was completely missing. I cut up a spade clip splitter in order to commandeer a single tab. Next I drilled a 1 8 inch hole to match the opening in the tab. This allowed me to mount the tab to the filler neck using a number 6 machine screw. I then fastened the tab to the machine screw with a lock washer and hex nut. I was careful to position the screw where it would not obstruct the filler cap's threads.
Older cars weren't engineered for today's ethanol blended gasolines like E85. Some of their components break down when exposed to these modern fuels. I recently ordered a $20 vacuum pump from Amazon. I used it to test whether the one-way gravity valve was still working. I expected this zero reading with the tube open, but when I plugged the bottom with my finger, the meter should have given a non-zero reading. A test from the bottom of the tube also yielded a zero reading, indicating that the backflow valve is leaking. I verified that the tube itself was not at fault by plugging its top end and retesting from the bottom. Having determined that the valve was bad, I carefully removed the factory clamps and the valve. Aha! No wonder the valve wasn't working. It's gone. This electric pre-pump should be tested before being reinstalled. I cut up a clean plastic jug with a utility knife, rinsed it out, and filled it part way with fresh gas. I submerged the pump in the gasoline and wired it up to a 12 volt battery. Voila, it works! The gravity valve isn't strictly required, so I chose to delete it. A properly sized piece of fuel line will work just fine. A red Scotch-Brite pad works great for cleaning metal parts, especially after soaking this unit in a white vinegar and water solution for two days. I used carb cleaner to rinse out the fuel sending tubes. Then all that was left to do was to reassemble the unit. See the blue fuel line? I used this bolt and this hose clamp to vacuum test it. I slipped the clamp over the outside of the rubber hose and shoved the bolt into the inside of the hose to plug it. I then tightened the clamp to ensure an airtight seal against the bolt. I connected my vacuum pump to the other end of the hose and discovered that the hose quickly lost suction, indicating a leak. I repeated this process with the black fuel line. And I got the same result. Looks like these rusty connectors are to blame. I decided to remove the fuel lines from the car in order to make them easier to work on. These white plastic clips get brittle with age, so I tried lubricating them with silicone spray and warming them with a heat gun. After releasing the first one, I realized that I didn't even need the screwdriver to pry the rest of them free.
I wanted to see the internal construction of the factory hose clamps, so I sliced one open. This little brass tube looks important. Too bad I ruined it while cutting up the connector. I figured a compression fitting insert might make a decent substitute. I laid out the pieces of tubing so that I could determine how long to cut the new fuel hose. I inserted the brass compression sleeve into the nylon tubing. Then I slid the 5 16 inch fuel hose onto the nylon tubing, lining it up with the mark that I made earlier. Finally, I fastened everything together with a worm drive hose clamp. For the black fuel line, I kept the original brass sleeve inside the nylon tube, so all it needed was a piece of new hose and a clamp. Before reinstalling the fuel lines back on the car, I verified that they were now airtight. Just to be safe, I warmed up the plastic retaining clips before popping the lines back in. In preparation for reassembly, I blew out the tank with compressed air, then rinsed it out with fresh gasoline. I installed the sending unit's rubber grommet, followed by the sending unit itself. The threaded plastic collar can be screwed on part way for now. We'll snug it up later. For comparison, here's how things looked on day one. I then installed the filler neck. In retrospect, it might have been easier to install this on the car and join it to the tank later. I first lower the car just enough to hook on the straps. Then I lowered it the rest of the way. I used a thin piece of wood as a lever to help get the first bolt started. This is looking a whole lot better than where we started. With the filler neck already inserted into the fuel tank, there wasn't much room to work on its hoses, much less get a camera up in there. After a few choice words, I was eventually able to get all three hoses reconnected. Then I repositioned the filler neck grommet. Here I'm fiddling around with a cable tie and a thin piece of rubber, temporarily attaching the filler neck to what's left of its mounting bracket on the car. Admittedly, it's a hack, but it's better than nothing.
Back up top, I reconnected the fuel sending hoses and vacuum lines. Earlier, I left the sending unit collar loose so that it would now be easier to wrestle the hoses into place with so little room to work. With everything reconnected, I can now tighten down the sending unit collar and plug the wires back in. Last but not least, I reinstalled the fuel door. Thanks for watching. I've got more videos on the way.